Am I being recorded? By all proper devices? Excellent. All right. Hello, everybody. I'm Jason Scott. How are you doing tonight? How are you doing? Okay, so how many people know of me and my crap that are here? All right, now people are here just because they're like, wow, this sounds so much more interesting than that other talk. All right, excellent. Okay, so I'll be sure to describe who I am and everything else, but depending on who you are, okay, great. So, I'm a little more organic than your usual hacker talk. I'm definitely somebody who goes more for the historical human side of things than telling you about this exploit versus that exploit versus some CISSP crap. So, I am going to be talking about a whole range of things, but I've had some people in the past say, he just told a bunch of stories. Like the human race didn't enjoy that for 4,000 years before that tard came along. So, just a little warning. Occasionally there might be some profanity. I don't think there's any nudity, but I'll certainly talk about nudity. All right, so this is Jason Scott's Shareware Kabakad. Uh, this is a discussion about shareware, shareware CDs, and a project that I have been working on, which I am announcing at DerbyCon officially, which will change uh, nothing, but will hopefully be interesting nonetheless, okay? Here's my cred, okay? This is me, 1983, wearing my awesome aviator glasses, leaning up against the Apple Cube. Uh, I lived in New York, but when we passed this cube in California on a family trip, I demanded my father pull over. Let me pose, Joe Cool style, up against the Apple Cube and, uh, and get a shot because I had seen Steve Jobs stand on this very cube in a Time article just a year earlier. So, I'm old. Me, 1988. Here I am posing with things I stole. <laughs> a, a, very, a very popular theme in, in your book photos, I would hope, but this is my senior photo. Uh, all sorts of bizarre semiotics exist in this. For instance, yes, the payphone and uh, the lineman's handset. And uh, there's uh, all sorts of uh, that, that highway blinky, which is what we call it. Dustbuster? Huh? You stole a dustbuster? No, you know, the dustbuster is an interesting story. Um, <laughs> I had decided at some point uh, at that point that I was going to try to get into as many quote unquote club photos and as many places as possible, and would always have a dust buster. So I'm in like six clubs, only three of which I'm actually anything to do with, and I'm holding up a dust buster, or holding it near me. So I'm like in there. So I've been, I've been like this for a long time. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so that's what the story is with the dust buster and everything else, so yeah. I'm mostly known uh, in the general sense for running a site called textfiles.com, which is a collection of BBS, bulletin board system, era text files, which has expanded over the years to do everything from PDFs and movies and sounds of uh, being online all the way up through nowadays uh, in being involved in uh, uh, having like e-zines and stuff that people are doing that they're putting out, you know, even as we speak, or podcasts. So I just had discovered basically in 1998 that there was really uh, nothing on bulletin board systems on, on the web, and this really bothered me because bulletin board systems had been a big part of my own past. So I went and got my floppies, and I had collected a ton of old BBS stuff, put it all up, and it turned out to be a bit of a honeypot. People would send me more and more items, and it would just grow and grow and grow. And uh, finally, in 2000, I put together something called the BBS list, and what I did was I said, you know, every awesome project that changes your life starts with one question, right? And, and my question was, I wonder if I could make a list of every BBS there ever was. So I went and I pulled through all of the files and I produced like a 70 or 80,000 BBS list. And it turned out that this was a honeypot for old computer sysops because they would look up their own name and suddenly there would, it would show up on some page that was a pantheon of all their old computer bulletin boards they used to call. And then they would write me long, long, long stories that never ended. Some of them are still going in a window. And I decided, wow, nobody's telling this story. I have a film degree. So I worked on doing documentaries. But then what I discovered was um, that a lot of these sites that were to me the new, new uh, things compared to a bulletin board system kid were uh, places like um, uh, uh, GeoCities and Friendster and uh, AOL Hometown and that they were being shut down with very little warning and no recourse for getting their data. So I started an activist preservation group 
which sounds like the worst thing ever. It sounds like a bunch of nerds with huge glasses smashing through your windows. But we're called the archive team, and we will rescue your shit. So we downloaded GeoCities before it went down, and then we torrented it. We also took Friendster. We've also been grabbing stuff up to today. We've got lots of projects going. So I kind of moved away from not just saving my own past, but to saving the future pasts of other people. And it's worked out really well over the years. Um, to do my documentaries and other things, I do get out of the house. This is my hotel key card collection. Uh, because I'll go all over. My first bulletin board system documentary was 205 interviews. The, the second movie, which was about text adventures, both of which I have for sale here, was made with 80, and each one took me a few years. And I love meeting my heroes. It's actually to the point, I think I've met all of them. All the people who built all the things I cared about, about Fidonet and all the different modem protocols and all sorts of hardware and games and everything, I've met all these people and I've interviewed them and hung out with them and it's been wonderful. My life has been absolutely fantastic, okay? Things are doing really, really good. As part of moving into physical space though, people send me things. So for instance, here's a whole bunch of magazines and a cat. And I wasn't sent the cat. But you have a whole bunch of items where I'm being sent things like old conference programs, old magazines, and I just started collecting those as well. So this had to happen. Uh, this is my brother, and behind my brother is a shipping container that, we, that I rented that produced the textfiles.com information cube, which lives in upstate New York, which I started to put things into. This is the picture I usually send people because it doesn't look like I have a disease yet. It just looks like I'm busy. But this is the actual thing as it looks right now. So this is an enormous amount of material, you know? And the thing is, is that we don't know here in the present what the future's interests will lie with. So I try where I can to preserve a whole manner of things related to computers, computer technology, to put them up there. So, you know, that's a fundamental th thought of what I do, right? Is that if you don't believe that, if you're like, this is all crap, and why are you doing it? There's not really much more of a discussion we can have. I can't go, oh, but this piece of crap is particularly pretty. <laughs> this particular piece of crap, they don't have many of this. It's like nobody wants it. You know, obviously there's going to be no confusion. By the way, there's a poker table there, although I think you can't quite see it on the critical, critical part of computer history is the poker table. And people send me boxes of all sorts of software, right? And I don't sit there and I don't, you know, oh yeah, see, emotional reaction immediately to 500 hours free from AOL, that's awesome. That's like getting 20 free nutsack kicks. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I'm not going to, like I said, I'm really not going to play that game. So I collect a lot of them and people, you know, it's interesting to watch the emotional reaction to AOL discs. But, you know, the fact is, is you can see people are like, yay, somebody will take this from me. And I'll sit there and I'll either scan them in or, or store them or figure out what to do next with them. So it grows and grows. So a while ago, I started something called cd.textfiles.com. And this has been up for about, I want to say about six years now. And what this was, was I really realized that shareware CDs were and continue to be one of the highest payloads that you can get with computer history. It's specific to the 1980s and the 1990s, but it is an amazing payload. And it's, it, 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 we won't see this kind again in this particular fashion. So there's no uh, 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 downside for me to grab these things, okay? People send me these or I buy them on eBay. I prefer to buy you know, a bunch as opposed to one or two. Uh, so this is like a payload that somebody had and I just grabbed all of them. Similarly, somebody sent me this. So this is a whole bunch of CD covers. Like so you'd have a magazine and there'd be a cover on the CD um, and all sorts of magazines that way. People sending me even more. So I've been like really collecting a lot of these uh, and putting them up. So what you see there, for instance, is you see a single CD, and you can click on it and go down into its file directory and browse it as if it was on your own machine. And one of the things I've found is that Google is, this is interesting to me, constantly uh, spidering it. Like 24 hours a day now, they are spidering it. Like something, they must have a machine that just gets to the end and goes, okay, and go start up again. <laughs> I have discovered now, by the way, that there are some Google things for like 
fixing, I've just discovered that, and I'll explain how I just discovered that, but Google has a thing where if you do have a lot of files, you can give them a payload file that they download, and they check for changes to that file, download it, and immediately implement the search change for you uh, under certain circumstances, and I may have to do that, because this thing is constantly being hit. Why? Because there is three million files on it, right? Uh, in, right now, and this is, this is the current version, right, on, on cdsxfiles.com, is, is 293 gigabytes of shareware uh, and 3 million. So there's a lot there. And so I watch as people hit it from all over the place to get the free sounds, the free music, all sorts of things on it, right? So cdsxfiles.com as a hoarding project has been spectacularly successful. Uh, and there's a lot of material on there that's not really available anywhere else. And we'll go over with some of it for fun, just for the heck of it at the end. But just, just a lot of material, right? So let's just step back right into history, okay? The guy who comes up with the concept of what we think of as shareware is a man named Andrew Flugelman. Flugelman's got cred. There he is on the far right, hanging out with Billy Gates, uh, who's talking with them about his plans for DOS 2.0, right? So Flugelman was the editor of uh, a PC magazine and he had created a modem program called PC Talk 3. And in that thing, uh, and remember, this is like early 1980s, and the software has an idea. Is, um, you know, it's funny to watch, and it's even more obvious now because of blogging and because of people talking about it as they go. Um, watching how society kind of adjusts to a certain framework of thinking and then it becomes not just concrete but somehow pushes back through the past as if we always thought of things that way. Uh, and so, so an example of that might be the concept of what shareware and software is. Because right now we think of software as a product that's sold by an industry and people can make their own products. But that's not always the case. Uh, software is software as a concept with computers in the 1960s and early to 1970s is thought of in the same way as how many turns it takes to tighten a pipe if you're a plumber. Like you don't sell the process of pipe turning, you sell plumbing. And along with the hardware, the plumbing, comes the software, the installing of the plumbing. Well, that's the same way they think of it. You buy a mainframe for X million, and that gives you access to their server people who you pay a subscription fee to. And you're like, we'd love to have accounting. And they go, oh, we have just the thing for you. And they have a library of what they have for different companies and produce accounting. In other words, it's just a service in the same way as functioning uh, fuses. And, and, and so that industry uh, isn't split until IBM figures out that it's probably going to be sued for antitrust. And at that point, they go, oh, oh, it turns out complete horizontal and vertical integration makes us look really bad to the monopoly people. So to fend this off, they split off a company um, and a segment to create software separately. And this reverberates through the industry. There are people who are willing to go in and do IBM-like things for you. Uh, certainly Ross Perot, the uh, billionaire, had a company called EDS that was basically you know, a third-party IBM replacement that would go into companies that had IBM and say, we can do everything IBM does for like a half the price. And so that had existed, but it was IBM's move into software that did this. And so basically, um, uh, uh, the idea of software as a thing was just coming in in the 70s and was looking like a product that you would sell. So we started to see that and we started to see companies like um, Adventure International, which was the first game software company, and other companies that would sell you products that would then run on machines. Part of this because the machines were cheap. Um, so in all of this froth comes Andrew Flugelman, and Flugelman creates a piece of software. Now, previously people might give away software, and they might sell software, but they would never give away software they sell until Flugelman. He creates what he calls freeware, user-supported software. If you're using this program and you find it of value, please give me some money. And he calls it freeware. Now, this is the entire reason why Stallman kept taking a dump on the concept of the word free for five years, actually, was because freeware, he meant it to be, it's free for you to try, 
And Stallman had his own bizarre readings, and so they had to come up with what now everyone just chants, which is right free as in software, well, free, free as in my ass. But anyway, so you basically, you know, you, you basically have the concept of free because it has both an economic and a social connotation. So let's use that because if there's something a programmer should know, it's disambiguating variables. That always works out. So. <laughs> Um, um, so, so anyway, so freeware comes up, and you'll also notice, though, that he trademarks it, right? But he also has um, a bunch of licensing in it, which says a limited license is granted to all users of this program. You can make copies. It's not to be distributed to others in modified form. You can't be charged for, for getting a copy. You can't change how the program lets you know all this. So it's got... And it's copyrighted, so the license is also copyrighted. And you can see, one part of you can say, wow, he made all these mistakes, but you also have to realize that Flugelman is working in such uncharted territory in 1983 that he's doing all these things that now we had, you know, slash dot, uh, Rob Malta is still sperm, I believe, at this point. So there's no, like, ability to, like, debate this among a large crowd. He's kind of throwing it out there, and it really takes off. I mean, PC Talk 3 really takes off, and I, I, I contend it's one of the primary drivers on the IBM platform that gets people on the bulletin boards and getting them online because it's such an easy program to use. So basically, you have a, uh, a program that's kind of a goulash of trademark and also copyright, but also freedom and also try before you buy, and this is really the opening of what we think of as shareware. And as I note on the bottom, uh, Andrew Flugelman died uh, in 1985. Uh, he died in the most awesome manner ever, which is that I mean, nobody knows how he died. Um, he had been suffering from a number of ailments. Uh, I have now two stories that people tell. The one I know, which is true, and the one that most people know, which is, uh, you know, basically one of them was that he was diagnosed with cancer. But beyond the fact that he was diagnosed with cancer, he also, as part of his cancer, had colitis. And colitis medicine that he was taking had psychoactive effects. Uh, depression, wild rage, and everything else. So one day he parked his Mazda near the Golden Gate Bridge and they only found the Mazda and they've never found Andrew Flugelman. So they've had a, they had a funeral near his, you know, he's, he's presumed missing near this bridge famous for people dying. But Flugelman's gone, but I dedicated the first episode of my first documentary to him because I thought that he was really, you know, unfortunately completely forgotten, right? You know, John Dvorak worked, walks the earth, but Flugelman's gone, right? That's how it works. And so Flugelman, now you know, now you know the core. This kind of pushes out. People don't know what to do with the terms, so we start to see these terms like shareware, freeware, beerware, postcardware, emailware. And the idea in each of these is you get the software, and the software works fine. But if you could just do something basic, it would be kind of nice. So for instance, if it's postcardware, maybe if you send me a postcard, that would be kind of nice. That comes from Aaron Giles, who then would go on to be the guy who creates JPEG View and is one of the lead developers of MAME, actually. But um, um, emailware is the same idea, except now you don't know how to write, I guess, on a postcard. So an email will do please, something, anything, anything. I guess it would be Twitterware now. Beerware is uh, please send, and, and this is fascinating. When I was trying to research this, right, and I looked up beerware, and I wanted to find out what other wares are there, right? Well, I don't know the shareware, beerware. Man. Well, beerware. <laughs> Beerware basically says, if you really enjoyed this, buy the author a beer if you meet him. Um, and I found on the net, because the net can be defended and can always be depended on for these things, somebody attacking beerware on a legalistic and, uh, uh, you know, copyright, trademark, uh, open sof software, open source issue. This really pretends a whole bunch of problems because it, it, even though it promises this, it, 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 it delivers it in perpetuity, which is a major issue, and yet it doesn't give any sorts of... And I was like, this is where you want the punch guy you're reading button, right? <laughs> punch, 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 punch. I, I, I play Halo, a lot of Halo, and uh, I consider the pre-game before the game the real game. Um, and, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, and it's funny because people will get very, you know, they'll be like, you're 41 and you're still playing Halo? And I'm like, I did not know it had a maximum age as well as a minimum. 
But, you know, just every once in a while, there'll be somebody who just says some sort of um, uh, uh, devastating, horrible thing. And, and every once in a while, I get one of these cases where I just have to, you know, I, 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 I say to them, I would pay 20 Xbox credits to punch you in the face. <laughs> do you think I can do that? And, or, or the other one is when I mute them. I say, you know, if it cost me, you know, 20 credits to mute this guy, I would be paying it right now. Mute. Um, by the way, how do you win Halo pregame? The way you win Halo pregame is uh, normally uh, in a, in a pregame, everybody who's going to play is all in one place, and it's a chat room that's gone bazoo for about 15 seconds while it loads up the menu. Your goal in the Halo pregame is to make everybody stop talking in stunned silence. <laughs> Let me give you an example of a winning game of Halo preload. Uh, I had somebody where this kid was on, and the kid was just, it was one of those voices, the kid just sounds like Mickey Mouse really let himself go, <laughs> right? And he's going, he's going, and I just let loose with some major invective, right? Just some huge thing. And the kid goes, why are you on Halo picking on kids? And I go, because my van is in the shop. <laughs> Ten seconds of glorious silence, and then the game starts. So it can be done, just so you know. There is a possibility to win. All right. So over time, obviously, these things have actually kind of moved out into even more things, and we have all of these variations off the wear thing. So there's nag wear, where it actually kind of constantly bothers you before you start the program, and maybe when you end, and says, maybe you really want to give me money? And then, of course, malware, which was where we just kind of classified that to anything where it takes an undue advantage of you, right? Where it actually sits there and, and, and says, like, well, surely I can, I mean, he's playing a game. I certainly can have his email contacts. You know, the, the kind of thinking that we have there. Scareware is where that acts like one thing and then freaks you out because it acts another way. And of course, adware, where you're getting it for free, but that's because this asshole has sold it to an advertising company. And, you know, I've been watching this kind of go. I think, I, I like to think I know that the thing that really pushed it to me. <clears throat> um, wow. I'm actually getting bile in my throat thinking about it, <clears throat> was, um, you know, all these peer-to-peer -peer programs where they would, like, <clears throat> when you, they, they invented the fucking quit to task bar idea, where it's like, I'm going to quit. Oh, you mean quit like I, you can't see me anymore. Got it. And that they would start to sell products. And even, like, if I downloaded a, ver a new version of uTorrent onto my, um, onto my laptop recently, and... It did this thing. Now, now, Real Player did this too, if you remember Real Player. Real Player was great at having a check boxes for you to say, like, I don't want this, I don't want this, but it was a scroll window. So if you didn't scroll it, you didn't see the left there checked things. God, they need, oh man. Anyway, so I saw just recently one where it said, Do you want to install this toolbar? And you would go, No and no. And there was basically an option of next where it said, yeah, just install the toolbar. And then under it was cancel, which meant continue. Okay? You are no longer part of the fucking human race at that point. We get to turn you into a sandwich for bears. All right? <laughs> just if any of you are out there going like, well, it gets a little extra money. Yes. Yes. Knocking down children and taking their pennies gets you money, too. Why don't you go do that, too? You know, it's just like there's this kind of like destruction of the social contract. What the original shareware was was a social contract saying, I trust you. Check it out. Isn't this amazing? We'll get something from it. So we've lost something there. So history is kind of fun, isn't it? Here's a 1935 uh, uh, discussion of a person-to-person -person instant messaging system that they would install outside of a subway. So you could leave a message for somebody, and then they would come back and, 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 and check it later to see if there was a message for them. Uh, didn't go anywhere, obviously, um, but there you go. Here's a beautiful ad for some cocaine accessories from the 1970s. <laughs> go ahead, you deserve it. <laughs> Top quality spoon and, 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 and stuff to hold it, so, you know, that's great.
you know? And here's something called the Alaska card. This is a card that would plug into an Apple II and would take snapshots of memory. Uh, now remember, for people who are particularly younger, you know, obviously the, the thing looks like, I mean, the, the, if you're now used to wor a world like the Arduino, this thing looks like a friggin' tractor trailer attached to a, to a dip switch and you don't know what's going on. And, and the reason why is just because that's the chip size then. So the fab size is much huger. I mean, nowadays people could like use their fingernails and like make the thing work better. But um, at the time, this is basically an item that enables you to copy programs in memory. So even though they had any sort of copy protection on the disk, you could blow out an image of the memory and then pop it back in again. And this was sold. <clears throat> they got sued. Uh, I think they sort of stuck around, but then the business kind of moved to elsewhere. But, you know, one of the things is, um, you know, we'll go back, is that this, all of these things are things that somebody before us thought should be saved. That is to say, they kept the original magazine, they kept a picture, they kept something. They didn't know that all of these might, you know, nobody who's saving a cocaine ad might think, oh, well, this is going to be pretty hilarious in 20 years. Or this 1935 instant messaging system, oh, when they finally invent Twitter, people are going to laugh their asses off. You know, it's like the fact is, is, this is what I always say to people when they say, why do you keep all these things? I'm like, because I want to be what these people were, whoever they were, who said, no, I'm going to keep this. This might actually have use later. I'm going to store it nicely, make it easy to find, and we'll see what the present thinks about it. And I think that we can constantly learn from that. And so that's part of my belief with this stuff. And so the same thing applies to this old, old, old software. So I'd been collecting and doing this stuff. I worked as a hosting company. Uh, drone for many, many years, and then one day they fired me uh, for being me, which is awesome. That's the best reason to fire me. And uh, it was okay. It was all cool. It was cool. Uh, and um, I didn't want to do hosting anymore because it's awful. Uh, I know people here work in hosting and stuff, but um, there's a whole situation with telegraph operators. All right? So when telegraph operation starts out, it is exactly, you would be stunned if you went back and looked at the, the documentation and the parties and the conventions and everything, how much um, uh, uh, telegraph operations very much parallels system administration. You're a badass, you drink hard, you get things done, you know what to do, you improvise. There's an entire meta language they talk over other things to indicate laughter and feelings and other things that they drop in as codes on the stream, some of which survive into ham radio and into today. And they live a really awesome life. And then over time, things like relays are built that can do everything a lot of telegraph operators do quicker, and they create keyboards that will do the tapping, and then they create things that let the keyboards get manipulated by a separate machine. And very quickly, the um, admins, the, the telegraph operators, find themselves from being badass guys to being miserable guys. Now, granted, you can't ship the telegraphing to India, but you can uh, uh, find yourself without making those day-to-day -day things. And I, I came from where it was, where I was doing day-to-day -day discovery and exploration, and I wasn't, and my job performance definitely showed it, as was by the fact that I was off making a 300-person documentary, um, which was probably a good indication my heart wasn't in the job, right? Anyway, so they fired me. And so I thought, well, what am I going to do next? I don't want to go back into hosting. And uh, so I thought, I would love to do this full time. Could I be a historian full time? Well, first let's, uh, let's see, what do I need? I could use some money to get me through while I look for a better job. So I did the Jason Scott sabbatical. And I went on Kickstarter. You can't do this, but, okay, I guess this represents an exploit, right? But uh, you can't do it anymore. It's no longer zero day. But I did this in like 2009. And what I said was, <laughs> here's the pitch. <clears throat> Does everyone know what Kickstarter is? The greatest thing that ever happened. Anyone not know what Kickstarter is? I can go through it very quickly. All right, good. Now, distributed cyber begging. So, <laughs> with a back-end admin interface that's awesome. Um, so, uh, you come up with a project and then people give money towards it. So, my project was, I'm me, I want to keep being me, give me money, and I will spend it. <laughs> now, now, granted, at this point, I had been doing computer history for nigh on 10 years in a public fashion, so people knew who I was, and I was talking about what I would do and everything else. But there was no project, per se, right? There was just, 
I just don't want to work at other things than computer history. And people said, yeah, I want the guy who did CD to textfiles.com and textfiles.com to do even more really quickly. And, it, and, and I got it. I got $25,000 uh, to do this. Actually, I got $28,000. So I used that money, and I did not work at another job for uh, about nine months. I finished Git Lamp, the second documentary. I lived off the money for that for a while and kept looking for a job. And finally, this past May, I got the job. I'll show you the salt mines I work at these days. This is the Internet Archive in San Francisco, California. Archive.org. Creators of the Wayback Machine and uh, with something on the order of seven or eight petabytes of disk space. Uh, and uh, I, I have a title there. My official title is uh, Free Range Archivist. which means I literally go through the landscape copying shit. <laughs> and uh, so I, so basically I went to work for these guys and, um, uh, uh, and I just love it there, right? Uh, I work out of New York, I go there frequently to San Francisco and uh, I intentionally take not too huge a salary but I'm able to work from home and do a bunch of things and kind of set myself. And as I was laid off for being Jason Scott, uh, in the job discussion to hire me, uh, the, 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 the CEO of um, the, the, the head of uh, Internet Archive said, well, your job description is be Jason Scott. So I guess I'm saying to people, if you feel like, like you're really miserable where you are, there might be a place that wants nothing but someone like you. So look hard, because by the time I was done after 10 years as being an admin, I had deadly high blood pressure, and I was miserable doing things I didn't want to do. Now every waking moment I do is fun. So I encourage just a little bit of looking out there. Don't be too afraid. And if not, beg everybody for money. Apparently that works too. <laughs> Give me money. These guys are badass about digitizing. Like this is a whole range of um, video and audio hardware at the archive. Um, that building, by the way, is an old um, Christian science reading church that they've now turned into an internet data center. Um, so it's still, got the, it's still got the sanctuary and the organ, um, except that the, uh, the psalm that's set up is, uh, is uh, pie. But uh, it's a beautiful place. It's one of the few, I like to think it's one of the few archiving entities that has a pipe organ on premises that works, that blasts every once in a while because somebody will come in and go, oh, you have a pipe organ. I play pipe organ. <laughs> so down there is a multi, multi-thousand dollar um, uh, film scanner, it scans frame by frame, um, that was just used recently by Rick Prelinger to digitize a 1904, I believe, or 1907 drive down San Francisco. And he digitized it and created a 114 gigabyte uh, movie file. That's really nice, right? So we're like really working to like get lots of really cool, amazing things. It's a Betamax player and all sorts of things. So it's not just like computer hardware and software and uh, uh, items of like, you know, they do scan books. They do scan a whole bunch of things. Um, I helped them scan a Braille Playboy. Because <laughs> I knew it would get attention, and it did, by the way. Because um, it takes you through their whole process. They had a new book. They, they just had a huge um, milestone pass last week. They put up their three millionth book for free. You can browse it. No! No, new machine! Don't do a thing a new machine does. Oh, you bitch. <laughs> this new machine and I are still getting to know each other. Really? <laughs> I'm just stunned. All I wanted it to do was show a picture. That was its entire task process. I didn't go like render a, you bitch. I hate everything about you. Anyway. Positive, positive, positive. So life is really great. <laughs> and I love technology and computers. And I love talking about their history. They scan a book once every 90 seconds through all of their data centers. Uh, they have a bunch of scanning centers and they do all this amazing work to bring this stuff online essentially for free. You can go on there right now and browse anything you want to. So they said, Jason, why don't you come in and sh do some of what you do? Um, so I did. 
So my first pilot project is this one, Arcade Manuals, which is at um, archive.org slash details slash arcade manuals. Um, I have put up so far 363 arcade game manuals. These are things like the manuals you would find inside of an Asteroids or a Pac-Man or any one of these other systems. And the idea was here's computer history, here's a technical project, a technical um, uh, product that will have a manual that will show things. And I've been slow, I've actually got 4,000 manuals to put up, but I'm having people describe them as they go. So by having people who are volunteers, and any of you can volunteer, I have them read the manuals and do a quick summary. That's why it's only been taking so long. Why are they interesting? Well, this one's fascinating to me, for instance. This is a 1969 Drive Master done by the Chicago Coin Company, which did not stay in business for very long. It has an animated panoramic variable driving movement in full natural color, which is not something that you hear with Ridge Racer. And revolutionary new realistic windshield view driving, which we now call first person, right? And this thing is, uh, this thing is basically discrete electromechanical uh, uh, hardware to provide a projection of a race car. And you're like, well, how does that look? That must be pretty simple. And it is not. This is what it looks like from the back. I mean, you could spend, there is so much weird ass knowledge to be learned from this thing, right? You guys are all sitting there like, woohoo, I have a thing that makes a beep. And this guy, you know, I have a thing that gets a beep when you touch these two contacts together. And this crazy thing, uh, if you look down, if you look down underneath the, the, the blue wheel, you see that other wheel, I believe, I believe that's the collision detection track that's got sensors on it that are checking to see if you've hit the roadside um, as you drive through. That's my theory anyway. Um, so, there's, so arcade manuals have meaning, both in terms of society and everything else. So then anyway, that was my pilot project. That's still kind of ongoing. But this is the big one, and I said I'm announcing something. Fine, I'm announcing something. Guess what? When while everyone was sleeping, I made sure that archive.org has, or depending on how you count it, will have, by the end of the year, the largest collection of shareware on the internet. Because I have been putting up so many fucking ISOs, you would not believe it. <laughs> Okay, you went to cd.textfiles.com, and that was nice, but I couldn't put up all the ISOs. I, I didn't have the space. They've got the space! <laughs> At one point, I needed to borrow some hardware. I said, I need some space, because we're putting up a duplicate. We have a Friendster, which we took uh, before we went. And they said, okay, well, here's a machine. You want to try this one? I said, okay, I go on, and it has 140 terabytes free. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, yeah, this can hold it. So they've since, they've since demoted me down to a machine that only has 40 terabytes free, and I'm getting by. <laughs> but as a result, things like an ISO, a 640 meg ISO, who cares? So there are already 463 ISOs, actually, yeah, it's 463 on here. Um, but I've got another couple thousand to go up, okay? So by the end of the year, we're going to have it all up there. And the key here is I think this is the foundation for being able to access a wide variety of information from this period and before that's going to have a whole bunch of meaning for us you know, in contemporary space and as historians and people who are studying things. Already I've had people use what's on here to win court cases. I've had people um, use it for prior art. I've had people find betas that never existed. Nobody ever claimed this existed and it never got out, but then it turns out buried in one of these, is it? Because what would happen is, is that these shareware companies would go through and say, well, we gotta, we gotta fill up the disk this month with 600 megs of, of, of stuff. Where are we gonna get that? And they would go everywhere to get it. They would go to obscure bulletin boards. They would go to FTP sites. They would go anywhere they can. So for instance, this one, is 34,728 files about telecommunications from April 1996. This has all the issues up to that point of Telecom Digest. Um, everything about consumer um, owned coin operated telephones. Tons of stuff in terms of essays, Usenet grabs, tech specs, anything they could grab, right? Well, it's all just up there now, right? Uh, accessing it is a whole other problem and I'll talk about that, but you know, the fact is, is that these ISOs are up there and I think that we're going to be spending decades finding out some of what's on these things. 
For instance, here's a kind of a standard shareware CD, right? The 640 meg shareware studio CD-ROM, volume one. There wasn't a volume two, by the way. Um, but you know, you'll see something here. If you look at the bottom, uh, which apparently you can't on the shitty video capturing software, right? Can't see it, huh? No, it says dedicated to mom and pop. And um, it actually has uh, a little bit less than 640 megs, but don't tell anybody. Oh, Adrian, you weren't here for that whole thing. Why? <laughs> Adrian, have you a magnet in your hat? This is an Acer laptop. Acer, A-C-E-R. They made this laptop that's doing this. Let the record show. Loving hardware, loving hardware. The Shareware 1992 Data Express, you'll also see it has a BBS associated with it. So a lot of times these BBSs, to make money on the side, would have people upload to their sites, and then they would take all of the shareware, and they would make it available on CD-ROM and make money off of it. So for instance, here's one called Super Blue. Now Super Blue, okay, I didn't know this, and I swear to you this is true. There's actually kind of two CD-ROM standards. Like we think of what ISO 9660, but there's another one that's not quite the same. And what drives me nuts is Windows can read it, but nobody else can. And it's from like 1988. So if you boot this thing up in like your, your Linux, uh, your Ubuntu, and you try to mount it, it goes, oh no, it's broken, not readable. But if you go to like Windows, Windows 7, and say like mount this thing, it goes, yeah, here's all the files. <laughs> Weird, but it's true. And so what I had to do was actually, besides having the ISO up, I also um, put up a .zip of all the files, which isn't great, but you know, that way people can get to it. So, but this is very interesting. Um, this is an example of how far back this can reach. Uh, Super Blue is a compilation of PC Blue. PC Blue was a shareware group that would put out shareware on floppy disks on IBM from 1982. So there's software on here from 1982 going all the way up through to the 88 when this thing comes out because of course with floppies being the main distribution point, you could fit basically everything that ever came out on this thing. And um, as you can see also, just, just as a historical note, you'll see in the middle there, it says made by Discovery Systems, an American company. And all that is is that's the mastering, that's the printer. Uh, um, and in fact, in some cases, I believe, this is what I've discovered, is that what that is actually is not the duplication people, but the people who made the actual um, gold master. So they're letting you know that they're the ones who made the master. And there was some group called Nimbus, and I think that may be software, because mastered by Nimbus is everywhere. And the way you discover all this stuff is by doing what we're doing here, which is we scan all of the documentation and, uh, and the disks themselves as well as when we put them up. So that way you can make additional decisions. Because you'd be surprised how much is buried in there. And I don't throw away the CDs when I scan them, by the way. Keep them around. I'm not a big fan of scan and remove it. Because there's some shitty stuff out there scanned back when we had, you know, basically, what, 45 by 50 screens. And you'd scan and it wouldn't be useful now when we have 6,000 DPI. Here's one that's very interesting. This is NASA putting up digitized images from the Voyager spacecraft but they put it up in this crazy ass PDS format, all right? There is software that people wrote in their spare time in 2004 to convert PDS over to BMP because PDS is read by nobody. It is this metadata heavy NASA only format for this image software and if someone hadn't done that, even though this thing is on CD and even though they go to friggin', you know, borders of our planetary system, you can't get at the stuff just looking at it. It's not obvious. So there's this danger we have to always keep on by keeping this stuff up by having the formats available. And it's neat stuff. Very NASA. -y. You see it's images 24476.54 to 26439.58, which I assume is the file names of the thing as it's sending out these files back to us through space. Hmm? Uh, that would be Uranus. <laughs> This is a shareware CD about Uranus. <laughs> Speaking of Uranus, the, um, 
The thing that I found that people really wanted to know, though, sometimes is what kind of images were buried on these disks. So one of the things that my software does is it yanks down the ISO, mounts it, tries to find all the images, creates a gallery, and uploads the gallery. And by doing this, you can see all these sorts of references, and then you have a better idea of what you want. And I'm working continually to try to make it easier and easier to access this software. Getting the ISOs up was the first part. The best thing about Internet Archive, and I've said this before, I love this, nearly every other site on the Internet takes your original format idea, your original format file, fucks with it, and gives you an improved version, right? Improved for streaming, improved for speed, YouTube does this. And then if you're lucky, and sometimes if you pay extra, you get the original. At Internet Archive, you always get the original. And if you're lucky, they've gotten some, you know, easier to read versions, a gallery and stuff. But the policy is data in, data out. Give us the data, we'll give it to everyone exactly as you uploaded it forever. So it's a, it's, it's a rare thing, believe it or not. So, uh, you know, this is, can only be done because I can constantly access the original material. So like for instance, you get this beautiful bitmap. This is, an, this is a Macintosh pirate done in beautiful, I don't know what, that's seven colors? <laughs> Did he splurge? Did he hit eight? You can actually kind of see there's like little flowers in his sleeves because they use some sort of flower thing. There's some glorious artwork here. Um, there's a lot of artwork which, where the maximum resolution is 320 by 200. And it's very interesting to look at this knowing if you, if you lived through it, this was amazing that these colors and this resolution was there. And looking at it now with your jaded eyes, it's a lot different. Like fractals. They've kind of fallen out of favor as a thing to put everywhere. But here's like a classic example of a fractal. And it's really, you know, to realize this may be a day's worth of rendering, right, to produce this fractal. It's a huge thing. I found something called the fractal ecstasy. Tiny quick time versions of, of fractal uh, animations to classical music. The old Sun logo, uh, which they should have kept, um, with all this rendering. I believe this was actually done on an SGI, but don't tell anybody. This one may be known to some people. This is a Macintosh ray traced image. Uh, and ray tracing is one of those things that was always a miracle to me. And this is located on there. Now, I mean, I'm not going to go too much into like the software that's on these disks, only because software looks terrible on slides. But these are like examples of just things I'm pulling off, right? Ladies galore. Enough on that. So, <laughs> and then you get like these really wonderful high resolution images, right? Um, like this beautiful piece of work. This is a 1024 one that I found. It was a BMP where somebody just went nuts and rendered this vaguely fractal ray tracing, you know, beautiful stuff. This clown is everywhere, and I don't know why. <laughs> clown seems to be some sort of image reference. But yeah, you know, the clown, if you look at the galleries, the clown shows up all the time, and you realize how much these share, with, you know, all the dirty secrets come out when I'm doing this, because now you start to see who stole what from what, who's doing what from what. People can run analysis and be like, the clown is on 15 disks. And for some reason, this clown is like a standardized image test. Looks really impressive, but it's only 320 by 200. So it's a really well done clown, but the clown is everywhere, follows me wherever I go. Now here's where it goes wrong. Um, this is a calendar. This is awful. This is what happens when you work alone. Because this was a lot of work, right? You know, you're doing image processing and you're doing creation stuff and you're working really hard to make this unbelievably unusable calendar <laughs> with an image of a woman that somehow has actually mathematically removed the sexy. <laughs> There's a rose on the bottom, right? I mean, you know, you definitely have a rose on the bottom. You have a BBS uh, logo on the bottom right that's impossible to read. It's, it's basically bright. Uh, blue over a bright gray background, um, you know, and, and you can see the guy's name, Mike DeFantis, graphics by, and you know, and it's funny because in one way this is just great to laugh at, but on the other hand, I mean, you're really seeing it here, the, the true honest part where it's an organic work by somebody, right? This guy was trying to make a calendar, he failed miserably, but we all get to watch, and you get this beautiful kind of insight into how hard it was to do things. And you know, as, design, as designers have kind of taken over the web and kind of made it really fruity, um, 
the fact is, is that, you know, this kind of bridging of technical, you know, because technically I'm sure this is great. Like, I think somehow this is supposed to be really great, I guess. I guess if you're printed out, it'll look great. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you, you know, and the best part is, of course, if you're printed out, it's like this big, right? Uh, anyway, so, oh, yeah. Here's something from 1991 where they actually, you know, have some history of Baghdad and the locations of various things during the first Iraq war and uh, where things are, you know, what, what was up, what was down. And so there's actual historical perspective to have here. This is a screen grab that they thought to put up in January of 1991 at the picture perfect BBS. By the way, at the bottom, I'm just going to say this for the people. When it says USRHST, who here knows what that means? Not bad. So basically what happened is, is that modems were modems until they weren't modems. And then they started to do standards bullshit. So US Robotics went, US Robotics with the modems said basically, yeah, we'll do all their standards, plus we'll do awesome standard. Awesome standard being our standard. And it would detect if there was an awesome standard modem on the other side. Then they gave away free modems to sysops and said, if you promote that we are US Robotics modems, uh, you can have them for free. So they did, and they did. So it was basically this huge land grab on it, and the standards kind of went twitchy. But then we innovated on that in the 56K war, right, where it became incompatible with each other. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of little history in that little cube thing. So when it says USRHST, it's the high standard of a USR uh, modem. So, yay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to point this out mostly because it mentions group mail. And you'll see where it says 7520516 or 1107516. And these are Fidonet nodes. But you wouldn't have any idea what that meant. This person assumes so much that in your quest for the orb of Shandir, you would know, oh, I'll just go to this Fidonet node. Which, by the way, I mean, you're now going to have to download a text file to find uh, uh, where else you can connect to the orb of Shandir. So, <laughs> so you know, there's, and, and of course, critical, stolen Franzetta artwork. Because why not? Who's going to bother me? Nobody's going to bother them for another few years. But then comes the part when they start scanning in Playboys and putting up, and, and there was one case of a sysop who got sued by Playboy. Uh, because, for some reason, they didn't like that he was constantly scanning Playboys and charging people to look at them. Uh, and they, they took him to court. He lost. He lost. He had to pay $150,000 in a year when he made $3 million. <laughs> <sighs> anyway, so... Um, the thing is... <laughs> I, you know... I spend a lot of time going after a lot of what I consider to be really crappy ideas like, like, like software that mistreats you and uh, uh, people claiming things aren't and, and dismissing you know, old stuff or not. And I, and I think that part of what I try to get across to people is that if you, if, you, if you stop thinking of old software as just obsolete software and realize that these are going to be our artifacts, I think that there's a lot to be said for things like shareware things to be said for uh, uh, these old CD images that I'm collecting. And I'm collecting more, and I would love if people were able to, and I mean, any of you can communicate with me. I'm Jason at Text Files. If any of you can com communicate with me with any old copies of old ISO or shareware or anything that you have, I will gladly take it, okay? I take dozens of these things. There's so many out there that I have not gotten yet, and each one of them could be a treasure trove that nobody knows, and they will go up on the internet for free forever on a very fast pipe, so you can point to it and go, that's mine. So think of me as a cloud, if you want, if that'll make you feel better. <laughs> um, but, um, but yeah, no, no. So, so I just think it's a matter of just getting the word out about what the meaning of these things is, and not just to think of them as obsolete yesterday's tech and who gives a shit. I need no other further validation than things like this. This is a small hacker news thread. This is all three of them, right? The guy goes, there was a rotating clown's head, changed my life. 20 years ago, I looked at this little animation, and it, and it started me to become a 3D programmer and designer. And as you can see, it says three days ago, three days ago. Within, it was actually within five minutes, somebody links to the cd.textfiles.com uh, set. And the guy goes, that's it. Thanks. 
I can't believe how much this thing changed my life. So being the midwife to be able to take someone's memory away from just a mild musing to coming back into contact with something that meant so much to them, something they could just keep and remember, to me is well worth all the work I do. There's all sorts of things like that that I do, right? There's this beautiful, beautiful past and history that we're, we're walking away from really quickly, and I'm doing my best to save it. And I do this in all these things that I'm up to. So cd.textfiles.com is the current thing I'm working on. Um, but my plan is to go after all the software. So look out for that. This is just the beginning. <laughs> so I'm Jason Scott, at textfiles on Twitter, textfiles.com, jasontextfiles.com. And I have lots and lots of fans. <laughs> Thank you for your time, everyone.